we start this session. We have uh, eight presentations. All of them are here, the authors, except Alejandro Bernabeu that is arriving, so that we know that he is going to, to be in due time. Uh, we do not have the first presentation because this presentation at the end, Juan Manuel Garcia Guerrero is not coming. And so we have uh, in about 10 minutes uh, uh, for each presentation. In theory, we have some time for discussion. We will see. Uh, the presentations should be either in English or in Spanish, according to the, to, the, to the conditions of the organizers. I try to recommend, if possible, English in order to facilitate the understanding, but it's up to you to decide the, the, the language. And uh, we are just going to start with the first presentation. The presentations are not really uh, homogeneous. I mean, cover different fields of of applications, but uh, anyhow, they are related to structures. So the first one is the well, the fiber reinforced concrete flat flow or slab supported by columns, and this is going to be presented by a, a, a team of three. But uh, the speaker will be uh, uh, Alberto de la Fuente from University Politécnica of Catalunya, that is the, the, the first speaker. So please, the floor is yours. Good. So the title of the presentation is Fire Force Concrete Flat Slabs Supported by, by Columns. And it's a research which is being carried out by in a, inside a research project with other people. Some of them are here also present. Mrs. Mr. Ale Alex Alejandro Nogales and Stanislav Aydarov. This, this work is part of their thesis. And I am the speaker, Professor Albert de la Fuente from the University Polytechnic of Catalonia. So fire force concrete is, is a material which is already being used uh, with structural purposes in, uh, in several fields. Probably the most known are the pavements, uh, retrofit reparation, uh, linings for TBM constructed tunnels, on the other architectural constructions. And the topic I'm gonna deal with is about flat slabs without any reinforcement, traditional reinforcement except uh, steel fibers, structural fibers. Nowadays, the, the design of fire force concrete in Spain is already covered by the EH, the structural code. Uh, and internationally, we have the FIB model code two, 2010 that since the two, uh, 2010 specifically, the fire force concrete is gathered as, as, as a structural material. So nowadays, we don't have excuses for not calculated or uh, calculating or design it with designing with fire force concrete because the the design is covered by some guidelines so the the uh, the idea of this of this research is to eliminate all the flexural reinforcement uh, by using structural fibers and self compacting self compacting concrete there have been already experiences in these in this typology of a, of a structure and, and the fibers have proven to work very well in, in this type of uh, on this type of elements. There are already even um, edifices made with fire force concrete, the flat slabs. Here we have some examples in, Lit in Lithuania. This in Spain, this is the first case of a building made with fire force concrete, the slabs. And uh, in another in an, in another places, there are several researchers. And normally, the amount of fibers that are using are being used in these experiences is uh, is 100 kilos per cubic meter. So more or less, we are replacing the same amount of uh, steel reinforcement by fibers. But still, the uh, this technology is not uh, sufficiently uh, spread. Although there is a specific guideline for for the design of fiber force concrete flat slabs. But still, there are something. There are several things that should be still covered to to gain confidence on this on this topic. So, this research is meant to cover these these aspects. So, the first thing we made in this research project is to make a design of a flat of a prototype of flat slab, uh, of uh, with of a pile supported slab of 10 by 12 meters supported by piles, 25 uh, square uh, with a square shape uh, piles, uh, 25 by 25. And the first pre-design we made was 
with uh, the yield line analysis, design yield analysis by, by Johansson. And with this yield line analysis, we obtained, which is the minimum characteristic value of the residual strength that should be asked to this concrete, to, to this fire force concrete. So with this design value, we can uh, produce the concrete. So in this experimental research, we made several triers, uh, trials with uh, different amount of fibers uh, from 60 kilos to 120 kilos. This is a challenge in terms of uh, guarant guaranteeing uh, self-compacting concrete with this kind of, uh, this amount of fibers, but that's why we have the chemistry. With chemistry and the appropriate dosage, we can reach this kind of consistency. just for you to know which is the flowability of this concrete. This is with 90 kilos per cubic meter of, of, of fibers, which is a lot. Yeah, I'm talking about macrostructural steel fibers. Yeah, so suitable dosage of aggregates and the, and the rest, of the uh, rest of materials. So uh, in this experimental program, we made a lot of tests of, beam, of bending tests, notch beam tests, to see which is the flexural residual strength of the, of the different amount of fibers. See here is the FR1, which is the residual strength associated to a uh, crack mouth opening of 0 0.5 millimeters. And here is the uh, FR3, which is the residual strength associated to a 2.5 millimeters of crack width in, these, in this test. So remember, the, our target value was uh, 10, uh, 10 megapascals for FA3, which is more or, le uh, more or less 90 kilos per cubic meter of fibers. But we decided to use 70. Yep. Why this? Because normally these kind of flat slabs are made with between 90 to 120 kilos per cubic meter of steel reinforcement. So if we, if we wanted to make a difference in terms of commercial aspects, we should go to lower amount of, lower amount of materials. So we decided to fabricate or to precast this, uh, this flat slab with 70 kilos of per cubic cub meter of fibers. We made a compressive test, other tests. I'm not going to stop on this. And this is the flat slab. We produce it with this steel fire force concrete this with 70 kilos per cubic meter of fibers. See, no, no additional operations except pouring the concrete. And after, pro uh, after constructing this, constructing this, we, uh, we, load, we loaded the, uh, the, the flat slab initially with permanent load uh, during uh, almost six months. These were the several steps of uh, these four phases were the several four, uh, phases uh, for, for the permanent loading. And then after four months, we, we, uh, we, we bring the, the flat slab to failure. We use in deposits of, of water. Well, this is, this is the procedure. I'm not going to stop. This is the final, uh, the final configuration for the permanent loading. The total permanent load uh, for you to know, it's uh, around 9.6 kilonewtons per, uh, per square meter, which is a lot, which is a lot. But what we wanted is to put the system to the limits, to verify or to, uh, to make sure that the, the, the response of this slab was, was okay, even for permanent loads. And then after this uh, permanent loading uh, stage, we, we brought the, the, uh, the flat slab to failure using uh, water deposits. This, the increment of load with this water deposit was about seven kilos per square meter, but we were not able to reach the failure with this mechanism. The, uh, I, I didn't say this, but the thickness of the flat slabs is 20 centimeters. Yeah? And the dimensions is uh, five per six. So this is the evolution of the, of the maximum displacement uh, with the time and see after more or less four months, we reached the stability and the maximum uh, displacement was about uh, 25, 30 centimeters uh, after, after this permanent loading process. And then we broke to failure, and the, we stopped the test when the maximum displacement was 60 centimeters. We, this was our criteria to stop the test, although we, di we didn't reach uh, the failure. This is the crack pattern we obtained it for the, the lower phase, and this after bringing, the, bringing the, uh, the flat slab to failure. And again, we were not able to reach the failure, the, uh, these flat slabs, even with 16 kilonewtons per square meter of load. 
Remember that, well, I didn't say this, but the design load factor it was 14 kilonewtons per square meter. But we were not able to reach the failure. This is the crack pattern in the, in the bottom phase, and this is the crack pattern in the upper phase. So you can notice the yellow lines for the positive bending moments and the yellow lines for the negative bending uh, moments. Okay, perfect. I'm finishing. So at the end, we destroyed the with horizontal. Uh, we were not able with vertical loads, so we we went with uh, horizontal loads, and w with this we were able to break the the, the specimen. Furthermore, we produced slabs with the same dimensions to t to be tested on in our lab, but under punctual load to see which is the punching capacity of this material. Uh, these are the results for you to know. We were it were three slabs, and I want to notice the lower skate, the lower skater we, we obtain it in this test. Although we know that the fire force concrete is a material which itself has a variability, when we treat with big elements, with big yielded lines, the scatter is reduced. We also simulated because we were not able to reach the failure, so we decided to see or to forecast which will be the maximum load and we made a numeric analysis with nonlinear finite element models considering the constitutive equation of the tensile fiber of phosphorus concrete. And uh, well, we obtained the yielding lines that were observed during the test. And this was the maximum load, uh, in this case overload, that we could, could, uh, could obtain it. And it was about 16 kilonewtons. Yeah, this is numerically, so it's very, very close to what we obtained it in field. But still, we have more capacity. But if we want to convince the, uh, the, uh, the constructors to use this system as the fiber of, fiber of fiber concrete as material is a bit expensive, a bit more expensive than the uh, reinforced concrete, we have to go to other kind of analysis, which is sustainability analysis, considering the cost, but also the environmental aspects and social aspects like risk during construction and other, and other aspects. So I would like to thank you for, for your attention, and if there are doubts, I'm here to, to answer. Thank you. One question? Well, I, I, I have some questions, but uh, one question that we were commenting yesterday during the, 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 the lunch is uh, in my previous activities in a construction company in Dragados, one of our, our uh, uh, doubt was related to the, um, the to ensure the homogeneous distribution of the fiber in on-site construction, not only in amount, I mean in amount of fiber per square meter in all the, the, the floor, but also in orientation, random orientation. And our experience using self-compacting co concrete was that uh, the, the, the fibers tend to, to be uh, in the in line of the direction of the flow of the of the uh, of putting the concrete, which for structural poses uh, present some problems. Could you react to that? Yes, I can react. <laughs> yes, the, here we are talking in elements that work in uh, bidirectionally. These cracks across all the all these elements and uh, and the orientation of, of the cracks are mainly uh, random also so this this is why fibers in these elements work very well because you have the fibers of course there is a orienta preferential orientation but this ori uh, preferential orientation is in the plane because the concrete is flowing in all the planes so you have fibers spread in all directions in the plane not in vertical and in vertical you don't have problems because you don't have any stresses in the in this kind of elements but if we are talking, for instance, in linear elements like beams, there is a preferential orientation. And probably here, the fibers don't, doesn't have any sense. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Well, if not, thank you very much. And we pass to the next presentation that is influence of the, of the non-structural elements, I mean the, the, the partitions, etc., in buildings in seismic response of reinforced concrete structures. And the, 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 the author is uh, Juan, Ant Juan Antonio Carreño. Please, Juan Antonio. Vale. Buenas tardes a todos. Bueno, el, el artículo que, que yo he escrito es, es influencia de estos elementos 
eh, de tabiquería, cerramientos, en definitiva, elementos no estructurales sobre la resistencia sísmica de una estructura de, de hormigón armado. Estos elementos, eh, debido a sus propias características mecánicas, pues en algún momento dado pueden interactuar de tal manera que el elemento rigidez de nuestra estructura puede verse afectado. Entonces, de lo que se trata, la idea que intento transmitir es que estos elementos en nuestro modelo de cálculo, cuando lo hacemos los cálculos, no solemos tenerlo en cuenta y a lo mejor es importante a la hora de hacer un modelo que responda a la realidad. Es decir, un edificio consta de ambos elementos, pero cuando procedemos a nuestro modelo de cálculo, este cálculo mmm, tenemos en cuenta una geometría, es decir, vamos a definir unos niveles, en esos niveles vamos a introducir los elementos que lo, que lo componen, perdón, y cuando ya tenemos definida esa geometría vamos a introducir una serie de cargas. Estas cargas se corresponden a estos elementos no estructurales, pero estos elementos eh, a veces por sus propias características, como ya he dicho, puede ser que sea interesante meterlo como un elemento estructural a la hora de calcularlo. Bien, nosotros cuando metemos la geometría de esta estructura lo que realmente estamos haciendo es definir un sistema de ecuaciones, un sistema de ecuaciones en el cual tenemos, si lo expresamos de manera matricial, una matriz de elementos, digamos, cargas, es decir, fuerzas y momentos, tendremos una matriz de rigideces, que será la que nosotros hayamos introducido previamente en, en esta definición de estructura, y por otro lado tendremos una matriz de movimientos, es decir, fuerza, eh, desplazamientos y giros. Bien, si... Nosotros tenemos en cuenta que cuando la estructura entra en carga va a deformar, estos elementos si tienen una resistencia importante a esa deformación puede ser que interactúen con ella y de alguna manera pues esté este modificando la rigidez. Imaginemos una estructura sometida solamente a las cargas horizontales que nos propone la norma. Sabemos que la norma española nos tenemos que calcularlo a cargas horizontales y verticales. Las cargas horizontales pues serían la sobrecarga de peso propio, sobrecarga de uso, eh, nieve y las cargas horizontales serían de viento y sismo. Bueno, pues si este elemento estructura va a estar sometido a unas cargas, este elemento deformará. Si nosotros en este elemento vamos a introducir un elemento que tiene una cierta resistencia, cuando tienda a deformar puede implicar una, un elemento de apoyo que de alguna manera coarte esas, esas deformaciones. Entonces, estamos haciendo una, digamos, una reacción a esas deformaciones, lo cual implicaría que esas deformaciones son diferentes. Es decir, estamos haciendo una estructura, intuitivamente podemos ver que se está haciendo más rígida, porque estamos reduciendo esas deformaciones que no tendríamos en cuenta en el caso de considerar la estructura completamente desnuda. Entonces, claro, ante esas cargas, si nosotros consideramos las cargas verticales de sismo, estaríamos en un caso parecido. Es decir, nosotros, la norma española nos dice que tenemos que aplicar unas cargas horizontales en nuestros pórticos, aplicadas en cada una de, los, de las plantas de los niveles que hayamos definido en nuestros pórticos de cálculo. Bien, la realidad es que este edificio, cuando viene una sacudida, lo que está haciendo es desplazar la cimentación y hacer que el edificio vibre. Con este movimiento, claro, lo que tenemos son unos pórticos que los vanos que definen son unos vanos rectangulares. Los vanos rectangulares, digamos que tienen las diagonales iguales. Cuando viene el esfuerzo sísmico y nos de forma este pórtico, lo que estamos haciendo es que este vano tiene una forma paralelepipédica. ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Que habrán unas diagonales que se habrán hecho más largas y otras más cortas. Bien, pues si tenemos este elemento no estructural, digamos, encajado dentro de este vano, es como si hubiera sufrido un esfuerzo de tracción en un sentido y un esfuerzo de compresión en otro sentido. Pues, ante esfuerzos de tracciones, normalmente los elementos de tabiquería o cerramientos o cualquier elemento no estructural no tienen una resistencia importante. 
pero en cuanto a compresión sí puede tener valores importantes. Entonces, claro, ¿qué es lo que debemos hacer? Pues esto, estos elementos tenemos que intentar estudiar y encajarlos en nuestro modelo para que el modelo que calculemos se ajuste a la realidad. Entonces, estos elementos, ¿cómo los podemos eh, definir? Bueno, pues eh, ha habido estudios en los cuales estos elementos se han estudiado de manera conjunta, pórtico con muro, y ha dado lugar a una serie de formulaciones bastante complicadas y largas, lo cual nos ha llevado a la necesidad de establecer unas simplificaciones. Entonces, de los estudios que se han realizado, la, la fórmula más aceptada es la de idear un elemento, digamos, tipo lineal puntal, en la dirección de la diagonal comprimida. Y este elemento es el que tenemos que, de alguna manera, eh, definir en nuestro modelo de cálculo. Este elemento, bueno, pues eh, las dimensiones las tenemos más o menos claras, es decir, lo que tenemos es una longitud que es la de la diagonal comprimida, tendremos un canto que será el del elemento a considerar y, por otro lado, tenemos que definir un canto de este elemento. Ahí es donde viene un poquito la complicación, cómo, digamos, definimos ese canto. Bien, eh, este canto, pues hay varios estudios y el modelo que yo he estado estudiando, creo que es el más acertado, es el modelo de De Canini, que recoge unos valores tabulados y una serie de formulaciones. Todos estos valores van en función del tipo de ladrillo, del tipo de mortero, y conforme a estos valores lo que hace es hallar una rigidez concreta y, un, y determinar un canto, que suele estar en torno a el 25, 24, 26% del valor de la, de la diagonal. Con lo cual, lo que tendríamos que hacer en, en nuestro modelo que vamos a calcular, introducir estas diagonales y lo que tendremos será un modelo que responderá más a la realidad del edificio, no tan solo una estructura vacía. Y nada más. Gracias a todos por su atención y buenas. Queréis hacer alguna pregunta? You want to, to intervene? The, the topic is quite important. Is uh, how uh, about the interaction between the structural skeleton of, of, of a building and the non-structural uh, elements, and it is also related to the construction processes. Uh, and it is uh, included this comment in the paper. I don't know. Ante este estudio del comportamiento estructural de las fábricas de ladrillo, está, estaríamos hablando de una estructura casi mixta entre el fábrica y pórticos de hormigón o del material. Sí, bueno, realmente lo que estamos haciendo, a ver, la, la idea un poquito de lo que se trata es de, de establecer un, un modelo, digamos, unificado. O, a ver, lo que te, tenemos que hacer es... Eh, tener en consideración que hay elementos que cuando se van a comprimir mmm, son elementos no estructurales pero a lo mejor sí que pueden influir en el comportamiento estructural de nuestra estructura entonces hay que intentar de alguna manera tenerlos en cuenta ¿cómo? pues mediante una simplificación si estudiamos un modelo digamos eh, pórtico estructural con un muro no estructural digamos que tenemos un, un modelo muy heterogéneo ¿cómo calculamos eso? claro hay estudios que dicen, bueno, pues vamos a proceder a, a cálculos, digamos, metiéndonos más en cálculos infinitesimales y metiéndonos un poquito en, en, en todo ese conjunto. Pero todo eso, al final, de todo lo que he visto, daban soluciones muy complicadas, muy engorrosas. Entonces, claro, ante esa situación, eh, lo que se plantea es intentar simplificar esa casuística, esa, esa situación para buscar un modelo que sea más fácil de calcular. Entonces, ese elemento no estructural, asimilarlo a un elemento que sí que sea estructural, que podamos incluir en nuestro modelo, para poder calcularlo todo conjuntamente y tener en cuenta ese modelo. Es básicamente eso. Muchas gracias. Antonio, vamos a seguir con la siguiente presentación. La siguiente presentación, the next presentation is the use of special couples to lock the ties in concrete jacketing in of existing, existing reinforced concrete structures. And the, the Antonio Antonio Trimboli, no? Thank you.
Buenas tardes a todos. El eh, trabajo que voy a presentar eh, trata el, eh, el uso de un manguito especial de acero que permite de unir las extremidades de los estribos cuando se actúa el refuerzo de un pilar con la técnica del, del encamisado. Hace siempre sabemos la importancia que eh, tienen los estribos cuando, uh, en, el, en las estructuras de hormigón armado. Por ejemplo, las primeras normas italianas ya preveían que eh, en particular por los elementos comprimidos, entonces por uh, las columnas, el, eh, los estribos tenían que ser realizados con el mayor cuidado posible y haber una distancia eh, tal da escluir la posibilità di flexione laterale delle barre longitudinali. L'effetto di confinamento dei estribos nell'ormigon e nei elementi uh, comprimiti già è stato ben conosciuto per eh, Nebic e per gli inventori eh, del, della tecnica dell'ormigon armato. E la, il differente papel de las armaturas transversales entre las vigas el, el, el los pilares ya estaba claro porque por ejemplo ya en la primera patente de Nebic el, las armaturas transversales estaban puestas diseñadas con, diseñadas con las extremidades abiertas en la parte de, de arriba eh, porque solo tenían las vigas que resistir a, a cortante mientras en, la, en el en los pilares la, las armaturas transversales tenían que ser eh, dispuestas con, an, con las extremidades ancladas eh, por dentro del núcleo de hormigón. Eh, no es un caso que uno de los uh, slogan más uh, utilizados por la mesona en EBIC estaba referido eh, en efecto a, la, a los estribos. Eh, decía que los estribos son los elementos que dan la vida, generan la, las vigas y pues las vigas eh, dan vida a la, a la, al edificio. Sabemos en efecto que cuando hay ausencia de eh, estribos en, lo, en los pilares o, o, o son mal realizados, con un, un sisma se... Eh, se, se, se ha una crisis, se obtiene una crisis eh, inmediata eh, debido eh, sobre todo a, la, a los estribos, a la carencia de, de estribos. La importancia de los estribos se calcula, el, el, el efecto de confinamiento se calcula según el eurocódigo 8 con un, el factor de eh, eficiencia de confinamiento alfa che sta riferito alla geometria dello estribos e alla, alla, alla distanza e alla geometria del nucleo confinato di ormigon. Per esempio, le norme italiane e gli edifici esistenti piden che quando gli estribos stanno cerrati a 90 gradi, questo factor tiene che essere assunto eh, uguale a zero, considerare nullo l'effetto di confinamento. Y la importancia de los estribos en las columnas se puede ver eh, fácilmente con un ejemplo de cálculo de un edificio donde conocí, conocí, conocimos todos, toda la geometría, las características del hormigón y del, y del acero, la cantidad de acero y si vamos a suponer que por ejemplo los estribos de los pilares están anclado con los cierres eh, cerrados a 90 grados, podemos ver que el rapporte capacidad doma, demanda en términos de aceleraciones sísmicas, en este caso, es igual a, a 40%. Si, eh, manteniendo iguales todos los parámetros, vamos a considerar, vamos a suponer que los estribos están eh, cerrados a 135 grados y y así podemos considerar el exacto valor del factor de eficiencia de confinamiento según el Eurocódigo 8, vamos a ver que el rapporte entre capacidad y demanda es mucho más grande, más del doble. Cuando vamos a actuar sobre edificios en, 
hormigon reforzato, la tecnica masso utilizzata per ehm, reforzare lo spilares consiste nell'encamisado eh, armato di hormigon. Questo encamisado si ottiene con un spessore di 5-6 cm di hormigon reforzato con nuove barras trasversales e longitudinales. E hai un dettaglio importante che teniamo che considerare anche quando vamos a attuare con, este, eh, con esta tecnica che è sta sempre eh, riferito allo estribos perché teniamo che considerare che il codice 8 ehm, dice che teniamo che evitare soldaduras nella zona critica quindi nella cabeza, nel piede del pilar non possiamo utilizzare soldatura perché sappiamo che la soldatura tiene una modalità di crisi di tipo fragile sino che possiamo utilizzare manchitos è per questo che con la tecnica dell'encamisado lo estribos della, della nuova camisa non possiamo soldarla abbiamo che utilizzare una unione meccanica un manchito di acero però abbiamo che considerare che i manchiti eh, in commercio hacia un secolo, un secolo sono manchiti che eh, prevedono che il blocco si attua con la rosca. Sono manchiti con roscati dove le estremità eh, delle barre che abbiamo che unire tienen che essere roscate e tienen che rodear per entrare dentro del manchito e nel caso della unione delle due estremità della stessa barra non possiamo utilizzare manchito roscato perché non possiamo rodear ninguna delle due estremità quindi abbiamo desarrollato questo manchito che è sempre un manchito di acero per il quale la, la unione delle estremità si attua bloqueando con eh, clavos di acero le estremità in maniera molto sencilla e molto rapida perché il cierre di eh, un estribo si ottiene con 30 minuti, con 30 secondi, eh, entonces è, è molto sencilla. Sì, e eh, di questa maniera si ottiene la. la, la, la armatura la il siete delle armature trasversali eh, e teniamo che considerare che questo manchito tiene anche un un aguero di ispezione per comprovare che le estremità hanno arrivato al final delle sbarre hanno arrivato al final e eh, quindi tutti i clavos contrastano la e la e la le sbarre per esempio nel nel manchito inferiore non vediamo le estremità, quindi possiamo eh, in, in obra comprovare che la puesta in obra del manchito inferiore non è già eh, bene, possiamo rimuoverlo. Con questo manchito también possiamo soluzionare il problema del, del, reforzo, del reforzo dello del panel de nudo non confinato del, dello spilares eh, perimetrale dello edificio e per esempio per un nudo di facciata possiamo poner due eh, barre ancladas con resina epoxidica o con mortero di anclaje per dentro del nucleo di ormigon e poi unirla con un manchito e la stessa maniera per un nudo di schiena e al final vamos a ottenere una, una eh, geometria di refuerzo che è molto eh, ottimal per ottenere l'incremento della resistenza a, del, del, del nudo e a prexofessione di tutto il, il pilar. Molte grazie. Buona domanda.
o una pregunta. Not dealing with uh, jacketing, but just with the new construction. According to my experience, the uh, the production of the links in an automated way should be easier if the lapping is produced by uh, 90 de degrees. So, um, according to your comment, of course, for seismic uh, resistance structures, this is not allowed, or this is not a good solution. I, in my life, I have never seen a jacketing like yours with this way of uh, improving. In the next works, so we can... Uh, so, you think that this is the way we should continue? Okay. There are here uh, some people involved in, ja in, in, in jacketing. Mm. Joaquín, ¿te puedo incordiar? ¿Me dejas incordiarte? Es un compañero, ¿eh? Joaquín Antuña. Cuando estamos reforzando... Eh, 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 digamos eh, pilares o vigas con, con, con armadura adicional y, 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 y regresando vamos añadiendo una capa de hormigón o de mortero de vida eh, ¿qué hacemos con los cercos? ¿cómo los montamos en obra? ¿cómo solapamos? que es lo que él ha estado ahí planteando que, que propone este device, este sistema para, para eh, suplir el que no se puede hacer como al menos en zonas sísmicas sería recomendado yo no lo he visto en obra sí pero ya no pero solapando no Sí, porque normalmente la camisa tiene un espesor muy pequeño y no, no permite de hacer un anclaje de las extremidades a 135 grados. Y por eso la, la soldar no es una cosa recomendable, por eso hemos ideado hace un año, hace muy poco, este, este manguito. Sí. Enrique. porque la soldadura tiene una crisis de tipo frágil normalmente, no es dúctil. La, la, la rotura de, la, de una soldadura es frágil, no es, impro, es inmediata, no, 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 va a, no es dúctil, no, no permite de disipar, de eh, consumir energía. ¿Tienes otra opinión, Enrique? Pero no, la razón es del no, eh, por ejemplo una aquí no la soldadura no realiza una condición de simetría de la, de la barra, al final tenemos ya una simetría. La soldadura de, de una barra de 8 milímetros de espesor no es una cosa muy sencilla obteniéndola en, en obra. Es claro que en oficina es un otro, un otro tema. Es por eso que el Eurocódigo 8 prohíbe la soldadura, por lo menos en las zonas críticas. ¿Qué magnitud de, ¿En qué magnitud se aumenta la, o en qué proporción aumenta la resistencia a compresión del, del elemento? Esto depende. La, la resistencia a compresión del elemento depende de la distancia entre los estribos, no del manquito. El manquito, está, el manquito tiene que resistir hasta el límite elástico del acero de la, del estribo. Pues la resistencia de la, de la, de la, del hormigón... ¿no? Eh, depende, eh, como, como se ve también de este, de este dibujo, de la distancia, más son uh, cercanos los estribos, más resistente el hormigón. Thank you very much. Gracias. So the next, the next presentation topic is structural conception and artisanal construction in Robert 
Maillard Design Principles. And well, the, the author is Dennis Thastamni, but he's going, he's going to be replaced by Sylvain Rasner. Sorry for my French no, pronunciation. It's good, it's good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. I'm Sylvain Rastner. I'm standing here for Denise Astavni, as you said, uh, my thesis supervisor who couldn't be here with you today. Uh, during the first decades of the 20th century, Robert Maillard developed a series of inventive structures on the basis of a renewed vision of reinforced concrete. He was an engineer who reinvented three inched arches, mushroom slabs, and stiffened arches. He was also an entrepreneur who developed specific construction methods to enable these forms to be built. The presentation will discuss these two phases of the work of Maillard, the structural inventions and the fabrication approaches. Robert Maillard is mainly known for his design of about 50 bridges. The first ones are linked to the patent he got for box arch bridge, that it will be calling the system Maillard. The basic idea was to build the hollow section of an arch made of a lower arch slab, several longitudinal supporting walls and deck slabs forming a box section arch. You see the section on the right of the picture. These bridges belong to the series of three-inched arch bridges and incorporate devices to assume articulation at springs of the arch and at the middle of the span. At this time, the other engineers built massive concrete structures. Maillard also built this type of bridge, but this led him to invent later his stiffened arch bridge. These bridges illustrate perfectly the principle of sequential construction of arch structures. The funicular arch is poured first and alone on a light formwork. Then transverse supporting walls and finally the deck structure will be added as soon as the supporting arch has set. Maillard inherited knowledge about reinforced concrete from several key leading persons. From Larbeau, he learned that the reinforced concrete was not a specific kind of masonry. It can be thin, light, floating, etc. From Enbeck, he learned ways to calculate the structure and place stirrups for resisting shear forces. From Messnager, he learned ways to create hinges on concrete structures by thinning locally the concrete section and using crossing rebars. And from Ted Meyer, he learned that cracks can be assumed to be kinds of hinges in a continuous section. With a central span of 90 meters, the Salginetto Well Bridge is his first masterpiece using the principle of three inch concrete arch bridges. It's important to note that the Salginetto Bell Bridges bridge integrates perpendicular supporting walls on con as constitutive elements of the transfer of forces from the deck to the arch due to the span of the deck between the two supports. This principle came from the Stephen Arch Bridge of Maillard. Those images discuss the evolution of the geometrical rules that describe the arch from the first bridges of Maillard to the Salginetto Bell from an arc of a circle to a parabola. His research toward the funicular form enables the geometry to be a regularly compressed arch with very few bending moments guaranteeing its viability. Let's investigate the fabrication approaches. First, they made preliminary carving in the rock to prepare the support of sca scaffoldings and massive foundations of the arches. Then, a complex truss system to make the scaffolding. It remained quite light and narrow since the bridge was only three and a half meter wide. 
The execution plans show that Maillard doesn't describe the characteristic of the geometry of the arch, but defines successive level quotation. This is a technique of successive layers. Successive layers and successive steps in the pouring sequence. The execution plan show that the lower slab was supposed to be poured in the three successive steps a central one and two lateral one with stepped joints for connection. As visible on plans, Maillard sometimes use projected graphite at specific construction joints as a kind of anti material. What is a technique that seems not been used somewhere out of his work? A special attention was given to local work and material. Maillard frequently argued in favor of reinforced concrete for structure in Switzerland, a land of remote valleys, since all this was needed was to transport cement and steel, and steel reinforcement on site. Gravel, sand, water and wood for scaffolding were already there. Evolutions in Maillard's methods for design and construction occurred for further bridges. For these, variations in the average geometry, sections, structural features, and construction techniques will be observed. In Rose Graben Bridge, substructures supporting scaffoldings have been prefabricated on banks of the river. Such structures will then be lifted and set in place with techniques depending on the type of supporting structures they have, either cantilevering from banks with towers and retaining cables or funicular cables running above the bridge to be built uh, have been used for this. Variation in the sequence of pouring phases will also be observed. Larger segments of the arches will be casted in one step. Seg segments including the arch and their ribs were poured together with something or four steps for an half an arch. General geometries evolve, becoming more and more flattened along time, depending also on the span of the bridge. More flattened arches are not without problems, since they require multiple supports in the riverbed. During the construction of the Vessi bridge, for example, flooding damaged the system of scaffolding of the bridge. Another nowadays well-known problem for box section starts occurring. Steel water is kept on the bottom of boxes that are at the origin of serious damages to concrete. This short presentation illustrates development in construction of bridges with concrete during the first 40 years of the 20th century in the work of Robert Maillard. The box sections are from then used universally for bridges design. Only few specific problems existed in Maillard's bridges. They are linked to moisture and carbonatation. For them, Maillard had simply overestimated the, propor the, the properties of concrete. Thank you. Also, you are not the author no. of the paper. I think that, well, Reading this paper, I enjoy very much, uh, and at least I, I would like to emphasize uh, uh, two comments, uh, which shows the relationship between the design and the construction steps, and also the durability uh, concerning what you finish your presentation. So I was very interested in, 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 in thinking of the author taking into account the construction phases. Mike, would you like to add to help me in, in Mayar? Sorry, I, I am very impolite. Eh? I, it's, it's, it's pure elegant. I fully agree. Other comment? Well, thank you very much. And thank you for replacing the author. So the next presentation is text, testing the uh, of physical models in the Semen and Concrete Association. Uh, Bill Addis. Bill, thank you very much. Um, 
Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I apologize, I have a very bad cold at the moment, so I may stop uh, to re refresh myself. Um, I, I want to start with an advertisement uh, for a book that you will be able to buy next year. Um, it is about physical models. Uh, and it's been a passion of mine for, I don't know, 30, 40 years, maybe a bit more. Um, and I noticed that there's quite a lot of people in the room who did not know that there was a time before computers. Um, and this is part of the story of what happened for the previous uh, 5,000 years of history, uh, before about 1975 or 6. Uh, basically, uh, when engineers were trying anything new, they had to use every possible way of reducing the risk of a problem. That's obvious. Uh, and that is just as true of the Roman, the Roman engineers, the Renaissance engineers, uh, and I'm focusing on this particular period um, in, in, in the, the 20 years from about 1950. It's also very much of a privilege to give this talk here in the Instituto Eduardo Torojo because Torojo was one of the great engineers, full stop, but he was also one of the great users of models. Uh, as you will read next year. Um, in Britain, and in many other countries, uh, there were similar research and testing establishments. And these few slides just give you a bit of our history, as long as I can make this work. Um, there are two names that appear uh, which define the sort of history of this uh, institution. Uh, the first one is Maurice, uh, who, who's a, an engineer called Peter Maurice, who, uh, much to my surprise, I discovered was still alive quite recently. I, I knew him years and years ago, um, but I actually went and interviewed him earlier this year. Um, I, I think he's since become a bit ill, but he's about 96 years old. Uh, and, um, but he is uh, very much part of this story. He was invited, having worked in research uh, in, in Bristol University, he was lucky enough to be invited to come and set up a test laboratory for an organization called the Cement and Concrete Association, which had already existed uh, since 1935, but for those first uh, 15 or more years, um, they were principally concerned with things like design codes of practice, testing concrete, you know, cube testing concrete, slump testing, developing procedures for ensuring the quality of concrete, and so on. They tended not to deal with structures, I mean, the use of concrete in structures. And that came uh, in, in the late uh, 1940s, very similar to what happened here, by the way. Uh, I've been talking uh, with several people. Uh, it all happened about the same time, and I know the same, exactly the same happened in Italy, and I'm sure in Germany as well. Uh, so they got permission to build the lab, and Peter Maurice was the guy who designed the lab. Uh, but right from the beginning, he realized that this should not just be a test laboratory uh, for crushing concrete, uh, putting it politely, uh, but that should, it should start investigating uh, the use of models to help with the design of structures. He was very much of a structural engineer. He wasn't a concrete specialist. Uh, and right at the beginning, they, uh, the interesting thing is that the models they used were really quite large scale. They were of a scale to one, one to four or one to six, uh, which, as you will see, is very much larger models than became normal later on. Right at the beginning, they had normally two types of model material. Uh, one was uh, some sort of concrete. Um, th the word microconcrete is sometimes used, but that came a little bit later. Um, but they also, right at the beginning, used what we can generically call plastic. Uh, this early one was called xylonite. Uh, another one that they used a bit later was uh, perspex, which is familiar. The advantage of the plastic models, of course, is that they deform very much more, and so you can measure what is happening much more easily. Uh, one of the earliest models uh, of, of a more sort of st structural uh, application was uh, a big shell roof. Uh, sadly, there's no record of what this roof actually was, but it was probably the bus station on the right, um, which still exists. Uh, I should say, by the way, my co-author for this, Edwin Trout, uh, is the archivist for the various concrete organizations who have come together uh, after many of them closed and uh, donated their archives, and it all um, 
came into one uh, organization. And Edwin has provided a lot of this good material. Um, <coughs> the other thing that I must say I hadn't realized was how much work was done with these models on um, relatively straightforward, in some ways, relatively straightforward uh, structural um, systems, simply like a series of pre-stressed concrete beams forming a slab in a road deck, in a, in a bridge, a uh, relatively modest structure. Uh, so n not all the structures they connected, uh, they, they, they tested uh, were spectacular thin shells that we all uh, get excited about. Uh, a lot of them were, were, were quite ordinary uh, structures. They were finding out about how pre-stressed concrete worked and they needed to do that with models. Similarly, uh, they started looking here at um, m maybe not quite so elegant as uh, Maya's box girders, uh, but there were quite a lot of concrete box girders being built in the 1950s as well. And you can see there a xylonite model of one, a uh, perspex model, I beg your pardon. But notice now the scale is uh, very much smaller. They're starting to test with 1 to 50 scale uh, models in plastic, um, but maybe only um, much, much larger scale models for concrete models. Um, after a while, Peter Maurice moved on to become professor of uh, structural engineering in, in, in Southampton, where he, he was taught for the rest of his life. Uh, and the variety of uh, structures that were tested grew. He just about saw the beginning of the work on the um, Sydney Opera House, because they did some testing in uh, Southampton on that, uh, but they did other testing uh, at the Cement and Concrete Association. When Peter left, uh, Roy Rowe took over, and that's what the second era is called, the Rowe years, uh, from 1958 until he retired in 66. But having started off as a government research station, uh, the interesting thing is that Roy Rowe took it into what would be called a sort of private commercial testing enterprise uh, during the late 1950s. So you'll be glad to see that there were some very beautiful shells, um, a, 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 a typical four bay high par shell, um, for originally for a, a garage, uh, one to 10. Now the scale is uh, coming down, and this was when they were starting to use a material called micro-concrete, where they scaled down everything in direct proportion uh, to make something that was a, a model material in order to make the model structures. This still exists if you're in Lincoln, very nice. Uh, for me, and for some other people as well, the most spectacular concrete shell ever built, um, not because of its architectural quality, but in terms of its engineering quality, uh, is this, uh, it's a market building, which again still exists in London on the right, top right. Uh, it's been defined as the boldest shell ever, and boldness is defined as the span divided by the rise multiplied by the thickness. Uh, and if you work that out, it works. The bolder, well, uh, if, if you look at those dimensions, uh, you get to a large number for this particular structure. The, th the shell itself, for most of its area, it's a huge shell, 68 meters long, 35 wide, 39 wide. Uh, the shell is 75 mil uh, thick for most of the area, except at the edges to give it some extra stiffness where it's about 150. But for me, almost more remarkable than the structure itself is the model that they built. Uh, because look at the dimensions of that. It was a 1 to 12 scale model. So the model itself was nearly 6 meters long, uh, 3 and a bit meters wide. And the model shell thickness was um, uh, 6.25 in, in inches, quarter of an inch thick. So imagine something from here uh, to the other end of this table that is six millimeters thick. That was the shell that they tested. It really is like an eggshell, that sort of ratio. Um, anyway, they did tests. There's some good papers. You can read about that to find out. They carried on with a lot of bridges. Uh, the bridge on the top left is perhaps a little bit topical because we heard this morning from Tulio Ayori about post-tensioned precast concrete units uh, having problems, whatever they were. Uh, we had problems in London with corrosion, uh, but this was the original uh, Hammersmith flyover uh, where, as you can see, they tested, uh, whoops, how do we make this work? Whoops, no, no, not that one, sorry. Can't find the laser. Where's the laser? Just a couple more slides. 
Oh, it's the middle. Oh, that's even easier than I thought, right? Uh, and here you can see the, the, the little model box sections, uh, which were then pre-tensioned uh, with, with rods. Um, uh, there was another similar box girder um, in Manchester. This one has recently had problems with corrosion, and they have protected the existing uh, uh, reinforcement and added uh, some external new reinforcement as well. Um, some quite spectacular box bridges here again. This is uh, uh, the, the, the Medway across the River Medway. Um, if you go on the high speed train from Brussels to London, uh, you pass this, and it's still impressive. Uh, you can see here the wonderful model uh, at, at 1 to 14 scale. That one. Um, a few unusual structures, of course, came this way. Basically, the models were particularly useful where something had not been done before or had not been done at a certain scale before. And this was a cathedral, or is a cathedral, uh, built in Liverpool. Um, it's on a very exposed site, and so they were very concerned about the wind loading. Uh, but also this rather curious uh, a, a sort of a cone um, made, made of reinforced concrete, and they did a lot of testing on that uh, for, for very high wind. Uh, loads, but specifically they were looking to see the effects of creep uh, in the concrete uh, o o over time, and they, they spent about a year doing model tests on this, um, uh, this, this particular building. Yeah. The, uh, um, the, 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 the building on the left is yet another um, highway for the government, basically. Um, and, and, and for those of you who are not familiar with life before the laptop, uh, this here is a computer. Uh, and it probably has a capacity of considerably less than my mobile phone. Um, uh, but this was one of the first uses of computers in 1965, linked to strain gauges on the model. And basically, this was using, being used as a data logger to collect the information uh, and, and to begin the process of getting it into a structural analysis package. Um, but at that time, it was not automatic all the way. Um, uh, on the right, a, uh, a, a hyper, hyper, hyperboloid, yes, that's right, the word, um, um, uh, a cooling tower, uh, where, again, they were starting to uh, look at the design of these again. Ironically, in that very year, uh, uh, some cooling towers extremely similar to this collapsed uh, due to combination of wind loading uh, at Ferry Bridge. Uh, and so having done some tests on this, which was for a new um, uh, cooling tower, uh, they quickly turned the research project to uh, look at what had been happening at Ferry Bridge, where the wind loads were, were, were very um, much of an influence. So uh, Roe carried on um, developing the techniques more and more. Um, one slightly amusing thing here, for, again, going back to this old, old computer times, um, Ovarup were the engineers for this viaduct, uh, and they specifically, well, uh, the, the CNCA uh, were proud to be using their computer again, uh, but um, Arup commented that the use of the computer unfortunately set an up upper limit to the number of strain gauges. So that's just an, a, 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 a comment on the size of uh, computing power in those days. Um, but the, the viaduct is a very complex uh, interaction of between columns and, and, and splitting um, the main road uh, to a, um, the, the slip roads uh, leading off. Uh, you can see here the complex cross section. They didn't, of course, simply do this model test alone and say, right, go and build it. They were doing many, many calculations. Uh, and there was a very definite change of emphasis uh, during this period, as you might expect um, in the development of computers, where, whereas initially they had pre well, largely been looking at the models as a way of understanding the structural behavior, gradually that flipped over to the other way around, where the computer analysis was doing predictions of structural behavior, and the models were being used to support and to check, if you like, the computer analysis, so that people could gradually become more reliant on computer models. That took a, lo a long time. And then, sadly, the end, uh, sadly, if you like models, that is, um, in, in the early 70s, um, uh, the, the last model they made was for another complex motorway junction uh, in 1972, where, again, they were making one to five models. That's a really quite huge model. 
Um, but the, 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 in the heyday, the CNCA were very proud of what they had contributed, and uh, Roy Rowe uh, pointed out how important, how useful uh, the models were. Um, I think that goes without saying from my, from my talk today. Uh, finally, um, uh, we have uh, an example of uh, technology transfer from engineering to the church, uh, because this is the Bishop of Liverpool uh, for whom this cathedral was being built. Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you, Bill. Any question in Spanish or English? Because I think he's able to, to understand Spanish sí. too. Más o menos. I was interested in one of the comments in your paper about the, the situation that the designers were requesting testing uh, uh, activities in order to justify the, their calculations or what, to be sure that they were designed in an appropriate way. No? Yeah, it, it's worth um, making that point. Thank you for highlighting it because it is an extremely important point. If you go to any structures laboratory in a university today, there are still some models. If you went to a university department in 1980, there were still lots of models. Um, computers hadn't yet got rid of all of them. The academic community really used physical models as a way of generating a lot of their work. Uh, because they were absolutely essential to developing their understanding of structural behavior as academics, the, the, the engineering science behind whatever it is. I mean, there's all sorts of complications to structural behavior from shell buckling to, to whatever. And the interesting thing is that quite a few of the manuals on how to do physical model testing were written uh, on the previous slide almost at the end of the 40 years when structural model testing was so important in the world of real design projects, uh, construction projects. And so the academics sort of realized that this was something that they could exploit for their own purposes in the academic world, but the initial thrust was absolutely from design engineers because they needed the confidence. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other question? Well, thank you. So we move to the, to the next presentation, Precast Concrete Structures for Industrial Buildings, Past, Present and Future by Alfonso Barba. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, mi nombre es Alfonso Barba y os vamos a presentar esta comunicación sobre estructuras prefabricadas de hormigón para construcción de edificios industriales. Es una visión parcial como como todos los compendios del presente, pasado y futuro. Aquí en la primera imagen estamos viendo... Este es el edificio de trolebuses de Madrid del año 50, de Fernández Casado, que tenía un, un arco triarticulado de 37 metros con una, con una flecha de 560, se, se construye en obra y se eleva con, y se coloca en el sitio con torres de elevación. Esta es una viga del año, creo que es del 2006-2007, que aparece en el, FIP, en el boletín FIS 74, que tiene... Pone 52, pero yo creo que es una viga de 50 metros, de aquí en España, en Salamanca. Se fabrica 400 metros, se transporta. Ahora el transporte este en concreto duró dos días y se monta posteriormente, con dos grúas de 160 toneladas. Por tanto, bueno, pues un pequeño compendio de estado del arte sobre las estructuras prefabricadas de hormigón que vamos a ligar con los avances en las técnicas del pretensado, que creemos que a nivel de, de cubiertas en edificios industriales ha sido fundamental, el avance de la industrialización y esto como las estructuras de cubierta en los edificios industriales han ido evolucionando. Del hormigón prefabricado, pues un, una, una breve reseña, eh, altas prestaciones, control de calidad a nivel intenso, ventajas de la prefabricación industrial, independencia de las circunstancias climáticas, seguridad, mayor distancia entre juntas, y por tener un número gordo, rendimientos de montaje de 200, 300 metros cuadrados día y equipo. Es decir, estaríamos montando en cubiertas 1.500 metros cuadrados a la semana, aproximadamente. 
la evolución en España, igual que en el resto de Europa y en otros países, pues ha ido de la mano de buscar mayores estándares de calidad, de reducir plazos, de acostar eh, costes, las fábricas cada vez más, más automatizadas y, bueno, sobre todo, eh, materiales como el hormigón autocompactante, que aquí en España se explicita en una monografía, de la que hablaremos más adelante, hormigón ligero con fibras, y la generalización del uso de, del pretensado. Bueno, por hablar un poco del, del tema del pretensado, bueno, Freisenet patenta en 1928, esto es un ejemplo que pone Fernández Ordóñez en su libro sobre Freisenet, de la primera, la que datan como primera viga, que es un ensayo de una viga de 20 metros en Frankfurt, en el año 33. Vale, esto es otro ejemplo de Freisenet, del año 47, de 63 metros, con canto en los extremos de 3,40 y canto en el centro de 4 metros. Aquí, aquí en España, eh, la primera intuición, como ya hablan en algunos libros de, de Eduardo Torroja, en el acueducto de Tempul, eh, viendo que tiene necesidad de limitar fisuración y alargamiento de tirantes, eh, como aparece ya de forma intuitiva, también aparece en la cubierta del mercado de Algeciras, en el, en el anillo tirante postesado del año 33, y posteriormente pues, lo veremos en alguna otra organización como el acueducto de, de Ayot del 42. Por hacer un, un breve resumen, eh, nosotros... Queríamos ver qué es lo que se había publicado. Hemos ido a la revista Hormigón Pretensado, Realizaciones Españolas, que tiene ocho tomos, entre el 53 y el 2016. El pasado lejano lo hemos centrado hasta el año 78, que es un pasado en el que se habla bastante de edificaciones. Entre el 78 y el 2008 lo hemos acotado ahí por la aparición de la EHE y la monografía M13 de hormigón autocompactante y porque disponíamos de una base de datos del 2006, porque aquí prácticamente en esa etapa desaparece la bibliografía de edificaciones industriales. Y de 2008 a 2017 lo hemos basado en una, en una base de datos de una tesis que estamos en elaboración en la actualidad. Si nos fijamos en realizaciones españolas, podemos ver que de lo que más se publicaba era de puentes, bastante más que de edificación, tenía un sentido por el orden de magnitud y porque además era donde el pretensado se expresaba en su máxima expresión. Si vemos en lo publicado a través de los años, podemos ver que referente a las vigas, en el año entre el 53 y el 70, casi el 100% de las vigas se prefabricaban en obra. Y, sin embargo, a partir del año 79, casi el 100%, vamos, aquí en concreto es el 100%, se prefabrican en taller. En edificación vemos que los porcentajes más o menos coinciden con los mismos años. Por acotar un poco, eh, eh, hablamos de prefabricación en taller a instalaciones fijas y transportadas. Hay, en la bibliografía hay un poco de lío, porque incluso la prefabricación en obra, durante algunos años, se sigue llamando así. Algunos autores, como Fernández Ordóñez, de su simposium, Utiliza la palabra premoldeo para todo lo que se hace que no es en una instalación fija. Hasta el año 70, que vemos? Dovelas prefabricadas, moldes de madera, la mayoría de los elementos son postesados, sistema barredo preferentemente en España eh, y, y posteriormente sistema Freisenet. Secciones muy variadas, que ahora veremos que se van reduciendo, hay cerchas, hay vigas virendel, hay arcos y el montaje pues de todo tipo, grúas torre, torres de elevación... Este es un ejemplo que, la verdad es que es un, un ejemplo que a mí me parece alucinante, es una cosa que yo no sé si ahora seríamos capaces de hacer, yo tengo mis dudas, que es el Chale Barredo en San Fernando de Henares del año 66, una colaboración del arquitecto Fernando Casinello y el propio Barredo. Son vigas de 27 metros y el voladizo tiene 15 metros. O sea, me parece una obra absolutamente espectacular. De hecho, el número, el número de, de ese año de la revista de realizaciones... Eh, aparece esta obra, aparece este dibujo que a mí me parece una cosa exactamente espectacular. Entre el 70 y el 78 aparecen las instalaciones fijas. En España eh, el pretensado llega de la mano de Fernández Conde, eh, que monta eh, Pacadar, prefabricados con aceros de alta resistencia. Eh, Grupo Cade y Alvisa ya aparecen también. Ya empieza a haber armadura, o sea, estructuras con armaduras pretesas. Las secciones siguen siendo muy variadas en estos años. Eh, en estos años en las publicaciones aparecen mucho las vigas hueso de FISAC, que me parece algo también muy a tener en cuenta, y es ya el, a, habitual el montaje con grúas, con grúas móviles. Eh, si nos vamos a, a lo que señala en su simposio Fernández Ordóñez, la FIP en ese año decía que el futuro de la prefabricación sería la prefabricación total, con vigas de cubierta en sección PI de unos 25 metros y paneles de fachada. Las secciones PI ahora mismo prácticamente en cubiertas están casi en desuso, es decir, es una cosa muy residual, podemos encontrar alguna, pero es muy residual. Nos hemos ido a las secciones doble T, por un tema básicamente de economía. Este es un ejemplo de Alvisa, del año, bueno, de, de la revista que va del 70 al 78. Esto es lo que más se va a repetir hasta la actualidad. Estas son vigas delta, o sea, secciones doble T de canto, de canto variable. Esto es del año 77. 
¿vale? El pasado más cercano entre el 78 y el 2008 hay muy poca bibliografía, hemos tirado de una base de datos de obras construidas de prefabricados Castelo, donde ya destacan instalaciones fijas, armaduras pretesas, transporte por carretera y secciones predominantes en doble T, de canto variable o de canto constante, o sea, vigas deltas o hacen así. Entre el 78 y el 2008 hay un gran esfuerzo de publicaciones, bueno, IEC Andece con edificación con prefabricados de Hormigón, FIPATEP 96, que realmente responde al FIP 94, una traducción, y la monografía E10DH sobre recomendaciones de proyecto. En el presente, en la base de datos que hemos elaborado de diferentes prefabricadores, es una base de datos de 122 proyectos, ahora veremos a ver lo que nos encontramos, y vamos a ver que es muy parecido a lo que había habido 40 años antes, entre el 78 y el 2008. En esta época, a nivel de bibliografía, destaca el FIP 74, de diseño y planificación de estructuras prefabricadas de hormigón. ¿Vale? Esto es un ejemplo reciente de, del año pasado de una, de una estructura prefabricada, que vemos que es muy parecido a lo que veíamos ya con, Al, con Alvisa. ¿Qué nos encontramos? Aquí digamos, tendríamos el pasado lejano, el pasado cercano y el presente. En el pasado lejano veíamos que la mayoría de la prefabricación era en obra, Ahora ya vemos que es la mayoría es en instalaciones fijas. El tipo de viga era otro, no tenía por qué ser Hacen I o Delta, eran otras tipologías, en V, en I, Cerchas, Virendel. Ahora ya vemos que la mayoría de las vigas son o Hacen I o Delta. La tipología de correas era otra, la mayoría eran forjados, formados por pequeñas losas o por placas que incluso se hormigonaban. No existía el concepto todavía de cubierta ligera, como hacemos ahora, con correas tubulares. Ahora ya vemos que prácticamente el 100% de los casos son cubiertas ligeras. Y los pilares, en muy pocos casos antiguamente, eran prefabricados y ahora ya vemos que prácticamente el 100% de los pilares son prefabricados. Vale. Si vemos un poco un análisis cuantitativo, vemos que antiguamente, por luces medias, por ejemplo, en vigas, estábamos en torno a los 18 metros, la separación de vigas o correas en torno a los 3 metros y medio y la altura libre de pilares en torno a los 7-8 metros. Vemos cómo ha avanzado. En vigas delta estamos en torno a 25 metros y en Hacen así en torno a 23. Es decir, hay un incremento de la longitud de las vigas media del 34%. En pilares también se ha producido este incremento y lo que es espectacular es la separación de pórticos, donde ahora la longitud media de separación de pórticos estamos en torno a los 10 metros y medio. Es decir, con un incremento se ha triplicado, o sea, un 200%. ¿Cómo podemos ver el futuro? Pues que nos gustaría... Pues que la prefabricación, como se ha reseñado en múltiples publicaciones, tanto pues, incluso aquí en el Instituto Torroja, en, a través de H, a través de Andece, que siga siendo pionera en incorporar los avances técnicos, como pueden ser hormigones con fibras y ligeros, los hormigones con nanoadiciones, eh, como señalan algunos sectores preferiblemente provenientes de residuos industriales, para reducir coste e impacto, eh, con el fin de controlar fisuración e influencia y reducir recubrimientos, esto sería muy importante por el tema de reducir el peso, porque la mayoría de las obras se hacen en instalaciones fijas. El tema de hormigones autorreparables, que creemos que tiene un gran campo de desarrollo. El poner en valor algo que yo creo que no hemos sabido hacer, que es poner en valor una cosa intrínseca del material, como es la inercia térmica. Un tema en el que estamos ahora desarrollando, como son las declaraciones ambientales de productos, según la normativa de sostenibilidad. Y otro salto, por supuesto, sería buscar valores, o sea, buscar soluciones de gran valor estético. Aquí tenemos dos ejemplos de, de FISAC, su propia casa-taller, ¿vale? con vigas hueso, y estos son las bodegas Garvey. O sea, ahora eh, prácticamente es implanteable o prácticamente es imposible encontrar, excepto en algún edificio singular, como un museo o un auditorio, soluciones masivas de este tipo, con vigas eh, colocadas tan cerca o, estas, o, o este tipo de soluciones. Esto es una fachada, esto es un edificio industrial de 15.000 metros cuadrados que para que la fachada no quede como un frontón se ha adoptado una solución medianamente arquitectónica con un, con un sistema de matriz recli, con unos ventanales corridos. Entonces, bueno, vemos que incluso dentro de los edificios industriales se puede dar otro tipo de soluciones para hacer una mejora estética. Y bueno, terminar parafraseando al poeta diciendo que pensamos que el prefabricado es una solución cargada de futuro. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. I, I would, uh, Alejandro, puedes empezar a cargar. Uh, I would suggest to, to, to wait for the, the discussion after the next presentation because both presentations are related to precast solutions. Perfecto. Si no te importa, esperamos a, a que termine Alejandro su presentación sí. porque las dos son de prefabricación. Entonces, creamos un coloquio Perfecto. común. Muchas gracias. So, this presentation uh, again is related to precast concrete in, in architecture, but uh, using or commenting a standard but singular. Alejandro Bernabeu es uno de los co-authors. 
Javier Gómez y Dioder, Juan, ¿no? Javier. Thank you, Jesus. So, <coughs> because the structures present an enormous formal and expressive potential and possibilities, but however, and contrary to what has happened with other structural systems, these formal possibilities of precast concrete structures have been little de developed. Indeed, after an initial time of huge development, investigations, and recognitions of precast concrete structures, uh, currently, they are mainly related to a standard, repetitive, and conventional in, in structures, mainly in the industrial field. The purpose of this presentation is to highlight these uh, formal possibilities of precast structures and to invite their development in the current architectural context. In this sense, several projects coming from different times and authors are presented in order to present different, uh, diverse approaches to precast concrete structures. They are grouped in three main key themes. First, development of uh, singular uh, structure and systems, the importance of the detail, and finally, uh, st uh, the singular coming from the standard. So to begin with, uh, precast concrete structures, uh, due to his, uh, the numerous repetition of identical elements, uh, uh, allow to, to minimize the technical uh, construction and economic requirements that usually may limit the development of complex forms or singular forms in in situ reinforced concrete or pre-stressed concrete. In, pre in prefabricated elements, the repetition of uh, very numerous uh, of identical elements minimize these requirements and therefore allow to develop more complex and singular shapes. This is the case, for example, of Miguel Fisac's uh, different projects, as for example, it is, has been highlighted the Center for Hydrographic Studies here in Madrid, where a number, uh, a set of uh, bone-shaped beams save a span of around 22 meters, and the shape is also developed according to the construction roof requirements in order to control or to prevent the, the direct sunlight incidence and to control the, the, the water coming from the roof, as well as uh, the formal composition from the interior space. Uh, Italian architect Angelo Mangiarotti developed in the 60s uh, different uh, pre prefabricated systems for industrial buildings, formed by a set of singular elements uh, with a very accurate uh, composition. This is, for example, the U70 system, formed by three different elements, columns, beams, and roof panels. The <coughs> The columns are very elegant and slender H-shaped columns that allow to integrate the, the roof drainage system, while the beams and the <coughs> while the beams and the panels allow to integrate different openings for also for crossing of ducts. So. Also in this sense could be highlighted the, the work by Perli Nervit that developed in impressive three-dimensional uh, structures formed by a set of uh, small singular prefabricated elements. This is the Turin Exhibition Hall that uh, solved with a set of very singular and accurate uh, prefabricated pieces, a vault of uh, spanning 75 by 96 uh, meters with, uh, with small surfaces and a very uh, accuracy of the, of the details. The details, the importance of the detail, the design connection is one of the most important and difficult e issues, themes in, in any structural design, especially in steel structures and in prefabricated structures. In this project, Richard's uh, research laboratory in Pennsylvania, architect Louis Kahn and engineer Auguste Commandant uh, developed a very singular, efficient, and intelligent solution 
for solving a complex connection design, assuring the effort, the continuity of efforts in both directions on prefabricated elements, but the use of post-tensioning in the connections. The Lois Building by Richard Rogers and engineer Peter Rice is a singular application of precast elements because actually it's a building that is mostly entirely constructed with in situ concrete and only the main beams spanning around 60 meters are built in with a prefabricated solution as well as the co connection detail that uh, was chosen to, to use precast elements in order to uh, assure, to guarantee an accuracy of the finishing and uh, integrity of the, of the solution as well as to achieve a uh, legibility of the structure. This connection showed the independency of the different elements and how it wo they work together through this, this connection. In this sense, it's more related like a steel connection and it has been said that the Lois building was a steel building built it up in concrete. John Woodson Cubain National Assembly is a huge, uh, impressive con construction, very large scale built mostly in prefabricated uh, construction, precast concrete elements. And in this project, uh, the connection and especially the joint between the different elements uh, have a very important significance in the, in the project, both showing the prefabricated origin of these elements and giving rhythm and scale to the, to the different uh, spaces. Finally, the singular from, a, from the standardized is a number of projects that use uh, standard prefabricated elements, but in a singular way, so they, have, they are appreciated, they, they have a, a singular manifestation configuration on the projects. Several houses built by Spanish architect Fernando Higueras in the 70s use uh, standard prefabricated uh, beams in a very singular way. This is the case of La Macarona House, where uh, a number of uh, a set of different uh, size uh, prefabricated beams are, dipo are, di are disposed uh, one above each other in a very simple constructive way. So we have a, a first layer of main prefabricated beams, a second layer uh, just disposed uh, above, above this first layer of secondary beams, and a third layer of prefabricated jo joists that is uh, disposed above. The, the total has a, a high depth uh, floor slab of one meter and 50 centimeters, and that gives a very singular appearance while having a very simple cos construction. The projects of uh, the architect Anton Garcia Abril are also very very interesting in this application of standard prefabricated elements. The Meroscopium House is a very singular project about the scale and the significance of the structure. It is formed uh, by a set of self-supported uh, beams. So each beam is supported in, in another beam that is support self-supported in, in the next one. Uh, configuring both the external appearance and the internal uh, appearance of the, of the project. The materiality of these different uh, beams is very diverse uh, from steel or, or in situ concrete or even stone and uh, they stand out several uh, big scale uh, prefabricated standard beams. And to end with, and also the paper mainly focused in the use of precast elements in architecture. I wanted to highlight uh, the work of uh, Spanish engineer Javier Manterola in the field of pre precast concrete beam bridges. As an exemplary, ex as, as an interesting uh, example of evolution in the development of, of this typology in the sense of uh, starting from a standard elements and moving up to, to more specific or singular elements. In La Acebosa Bridge, uh, actually it's a very singular application of precast concrete beam bridges. It is formed by just uh, one single uh, prefabricated beam spanning 45 meters and a set of, of transverse uh, also prefabricated ribs that solve the 16 meters width of the deck. The result is very attractive 
and very different to precedent uh, uh, prefabricated pre concrete beam bridges. These examples show the potentiality of uh, precast concrete uh, structures that have their own and specific uh, characteristics related, also different, to those of steel and concrete construction. And this is an invitation to explore and to develop these possibilities in current architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. We should open a short uh, discussion time on precast solutions, taking into account Alejandro uh, presentation, the previous presentation by Alfonso Barba, and we can use Spanish or English in this discussion. I would like Javier uh, also to intervene because you are deeply involved in precasting. So, uh, is there some future for the precast? has been exposed uh, both in the present presentation and in this one. I think precast solution have a huge potential. They started very very hard in the, in the initial times and, and actually it has been a lot is being constructed in prefabrication, but I think it's still a, a lot to be developed, especially in this sense of formal and expressive uh, possibilities. And I think also it, it has an enormous uh, advantage in terms of the ease of construction and rapidity of construction that uh, nowadays is, is a key factor, or maybe a key factor. Alfredo, repito la pregunta. ¿Hay futuro? Sí, bueno, yo como terminaba parafraseando al poeta diciendo que las estructuras de hormigón prefabricado es una solución cargada de futuro, yo creo que el, el plazo reducido, el coste acotado, que no mínimo, pero el coste acotado, y el tema de calidad eh, van a ser fundamentales. Y luego toda la lucha con, que ha llevado en la innovación, tanto en el hormigón autocompactante, autocompactable, como en el hormigón con fibras, como en lo que han sido los llamados hormigones de altas prestaciones, altas resistencias, yo creo que tenemos un gran futuro por delante. Bueno, si well, combinamos los dos approaches, uno es cost, quality, etc., and, and, and your presentation, which is the interaction with uh, different forms, etc. Uh, what about the, the 3D or the additive uh, uh, fabrication uh, that perhaps allow to produce uh, uh, different singular elements without the obligation of have a high number of repeti uh, or repetition? So, do you think that there are some role for the additive or the 3D printing uh, uh, elements for? for improving or increasing the production of the of the of, of the precast la impresión 3d puede permitir eh, eh, producir eh, piezas singulares manteniendo temas de coste calidad etcétera queréis alguno intervenir javier me ayudas que le queda todavía mucho camino Vamos, desde la perspectiva de, de haber estado trabajando siempre en, 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 desde la empresa constructora, yo creo que veo más camino, más facilidad en la prefabricación que probablemente en la actuación in situ, aunque se estén haciendo experiencias. Eh, me refiero a la impresión 3D o la, a la fabricación aditiva, pero en, en, en prefabricación entiendo que permitirá no tener que hacer elementos en un número elevado de repeticiones para que se justifique. Por favor. Eh, a ver, yo, yo en, en cuanto a este tema, y se ha hablado antes y todos sabemos, digamos que si bien hace 40 años eh, en la edificación industrial aún se movía en esos términos, es decir, bueno, lo hago, y lo hago tradicionalmente o industrialmente, y hoy en día nadie se plantea hacer un edificio industrial que no sea 100% prefabricado, eso no ha pasado en la edificación eh, común. Y yo creo que no ha pasado, eh, yo pienso, digamos, eh, que no, las circunstancias podrían ser las mismas. ¿Cuál es, para, a mi entender, digamos, eh, un, un, uno de los temas que es fundamental en eso? ¿no? La diferenciación de la edificación entre lo que es infraestructura y lo que es uso. Cuando uno hace un edificio industrial, 
hace un edificio industrial que sirve para muchas cosas. Y luego existe una equipación interior y también una normativa y, un, y, un, y, una, y unas licencias interiores en función del uso. Eh, en ese sentido está la idea de mm, que no es un estuche, es una caja que dentro pueden caber muchas cosas. En la, edificación, en la edificación hoy en día lo que pasa es que pienso yo que existe, mm, eh, no, no existe una diferenciación en lo que es infraestructura y equipamiento interior. Probablemente, y la pregunta y lo, la, la pregunta del lanzo, digamos, Seguramente harían falta que la normativa, eh, para que hubiese una industrialización de la edificación, que la normativa se estableciese mucho más en lo que es infraestructura, o sea, quiere decir estructura y cerramiento y equipación interior de otra manera. ¿no? Eh, pienso que eso, para mí, digamos, creo que eso es uno de los grandes rozamientos para que no se haya impuesto eh, la prefabricación en lo que es la edificación convencional eh, como lo ha hecho en la industria. No sé si compartís mi visión. No, yo creo que vamos, coincido bastante con tu apreciación y claramente los requerimientos y singularidades que puede aportar otro tipo de edificación dificulta más la, el desarrollo de este tipo de soluciones de manera generalizada, ¿no? Yo simplemente quería señalar que mmm, la edificación lleva muchísimos años incorporando montones de elementos prefabricados. Lo que pasa es que el nivel de industrialización de otras unidades convencionales han hecho que los arquitectos fundamentalmente resulte, les resulte más atractivo el hacer cosas más volubles, más, más a su sentido, que utilizar elementos de prefabricación cerrada. Yo quería hacer un ejemplo, quería mostrar un ejemplo, se lo comentaba Pepa, en los años 70 se hizo un concurso de construcciones industrializadas por parte del Ministerio de Educación y Ciencia. Se había arrancado de una situación de construcciones industrializadas, pues los sistemas Sanki y Durisol, entonces el Ministerio, la Junta de Construcciones, eh, nosotros la convencimos de que podían hacerse para ese tipo de construcciones, centros docentes, hospitales, pues en la línea de lo que estaban haciendo en, en, en Inglaterra, se podían hacer construcciones prefabricadas. Y dije, la solución está en que los prefabricadores cojan unos buenos arquitectos y que diseñen unos, unos buenos centros eh, prefabricados. Y realmente Pacadar hizo, me parece que fue Miró el arquitecto que, que lo llevó, hizo una, una, una buena colección de centros, en ese sentido Cidesa eh, también hizo unos centros, pero digamos tienen que ser construcciones muy, muy, eh, muy localizables, o sea, centros docentes, pero yo no veo en una construcción de edificación más allá de una industrialización muy fuerte, bueno, las losas alveolares son elementos prefabricados y desde luego es una buena solución para forjar los pisos y evidentemente, pero nunca llegando a una prefabricación integral y total. Esa, esa es mi opinión. No, eh, no, no, pero un instante. El sueño de construir una casa como un coche, como un tal, o sea, lo, eh, Frank Jure Wright mandaron de aquí una comisión de a Estados Unidos en los años 50 y estuvieron con Son, con Wright, con, bueno, con todos, los grandes maestros de allí. Y lo que decía era que, que el, arquitecto, el arquitecto tiene una personalidad dis, distinta y si utiliza un forjado, una losa, un tal, pero es complicado, ¿no? Los huesos de Fisac nadie los va a usar, los usó Fisac, quiero decir, aunque los patentó y tal. Que somos, bueno, somos distintos. Bien, la última presentación, la última presentación, sorry, the, the last presentation is building a stone conceiving a figure throughout an idea of structures by Tiziano de Benuto. So Tiziano, it's up to you to... Thank you. Perfect. So, uh, the relationship between the architectural form and the structure defines the problematic core in which to place the work of some architects who, in this dimension, find the operative, oper operative tools to conduct the research on the, on the space and the shapes that determine it. 
This short, uh, short presentation is focused on the world of form resistant structures and more specifically on polygonal forms. So I want to speak about the construction of a roof obtained with the V-shaped um, beams and uh, the way it is broke. In this occasion, I'd like to speak about a project by Swiss Italian architect Livio Vacchini, who proposes the construction of a roof through the composition of prefabricated concrete elements. The project is the sports center Malimat in Brag. For Vacchini, form is a result of a logical constructive process through which a condition of space can be described. This distinction that Vacchini makes between the distinction that uh, Vacchini makes between public space and private space is a significant premise for the formal definition of the architectural type. So the structure cap capable of realize it. Public for Vacchini means not oriented. Thinking about the public building in, in these terms means assuming as a, composi a compositional principle relationship structure capable of constructing and have a uniform condition of the element in the space so that uh, it is not uh, um, oriented in a pre prevailing direction. All the research of the Italian Swiss architect develops starting from attention toward the logical constructive process that presupposes the realization of the form. The architectural idea that seems to guide uh, every Vacchini's project is to, to, br uh, to bring a roof. Vacchini seems to decline every design opportunity with respect to this theme through different morphological type solution of the structure. So it is convention, uh, I repeat, I propose to investigate this project, the Mulimat Sports Center, uh, that is the last work of Vacchini, uh, made uh, with the structural engineers Lafranchi and Furst. So, uh, speaking about the, the, defi the, the definition of the architectural type, we can say um, that uh, um, the architectural typology of the building could be ascribed to the type of the old. Vacchini defines uh, the space through a serial sequence of 27 spans obtained through a system of prefabricated polygonal beams and columns in concrete. Postponing to the following slides a, pre a more precise morphological description of the architectural elements, it's possible to man uh, maintain that to the continuity of form, a single spatial figure resting on the ground is built. The linear composition of these elements in space constructs the, rough, the large roof below which the two gyms are located, separated from the distributive nucleus of services. The large roof probably creates the spatial condition of the shelter as an architecture um, cost construction open to the nature and in the nature. Already in Losone Gym, Vacchini works on the architectural type of the hall. The space of the hall is bounded by an isotropic and continuous peristyle on all sides on which the half timbered roof rests. The, ac the, the access to the building is configured through a ramp that is inscribed in the figure of the base and connects to the underground floor, waiting and alterated the theory of pillars along the limit of the building. Unlike Losone in the Mulimat Sports Center to an axial composition of the elements correspond a serial structure of spans. Vacchini describes Mulimat as a stone cut by the river through this figurative analogy, it could be possible to describe the typological condition of the building according to its constructive elements. Contrary to Lusone, in this building, there isn't a design for the base. The building resolves in its crux session the slope of the ground through a different height of the two pillars of the span. From a figurative point of view, the building rests on the ground through the termination of the pillars. The floor of the hall is held between the two rows of vertical supports, and so doesn't build the figure of the base. The internal space is delimited by framed structure for windows that defines the form of the fence. Now I speak about the structural type that is uh, uh, obtained with uh, uh, a set of 27 beams def uh, that defines the polygonal shape of the roof with a f um, 53 meters structural light. Each beam describes a view polygonal shape through uh, three, pre um, three prefabric prefabricated elements tied up together by internal post tensioning cables. Vacchini develops a structural system belonging to the category of shape resistant structures, where resistance is obtained by folding the surface composing the fissure. Just a, a short digression about uh, these, uh, uh, these, uh, these structures, and uh, we can. Um, 
say that uh, as Mario Salvadori says in the, this category of, sh of the shape resistant structures we can uh, establish an analogy about the, fi uh, the static figure of the elements between a barrel vault and, and a, polygonal, and a polygonal, uh, polygonal roof when the vault is working as beam. And uh, uh, speaking about the Kimbell Art Museum designed by Lu Luscan with the Commandant, uh, we can say that uh, this project is developed starting from this point, uh, this point of view, this condition. So the vault is only supported by the extre uh, extremity uh, through a set of pillars that statically give it the shape of a beam. This operation uh, is uh, undoubtedly significant. And uh, uh, as Vacchini says, it takes the vault interrupts its continuity with the lateral walls so the light can come in and uses it as a beam, preserves then the sense of length and no longer of width. According to Vacchini, so with uh, this uh, operation made by Khan, uh, gets rid uh, of the domination of the supporting lateral walls after, uh, after 5,000 years. So, uh, in Malimat, the whole tension of the project is pointed towards the shape relationship between the roof and its supports. And we have not a massive wall, uh, such as, uh, as in other uh, architectural experience, if we think uh, at UNESCO Hall by Pier Luigi Nervi and Marcel Breuer, or at the church in Ivrea by Aldo Favini, where the corrugated structures uh, um, are supported by a continuous wall. In, uh, in this project, uh, we have a set of elements conditioning light in space uh, through their, uh, their own architectural shape. Their shape describes a condition of continuity with the roof, and in this sense, globally defines a whole continuous surface resting on the ground and fulfills the condition of the shelter. Each of the, of the 27 reinforced prestressed concrete frames is composed by five pre pre prefabricated ashlars three of which composing the view polygonal beam. The structural supporting elements has a variable sectional polygonal shape ending at the junctional with the first resting floor with a rectangular transversal section. The variable, pro the variable profile of the support joins up the standing rectangular section of the element to the view shape one laying at, uh, laying at the height of the roof polygonal beam introduced. The link between the support and the beam is described by the fold connecting with shape's continuity, the V-section of the support to that of the beam on a vertical plane. The construction of the fold takes place in the supporting figure, marking in this point the anchoring of the beam tendons. The structural behavior of the support connects the, uh, the element to the figure of the pillar beam. Considering its stress condition, it, it can represent, on a figurative perspective, an interpretation of the shape of the element and its connecting modality with the beam. The connection between the, between the pillar beam and the beam does not describe a tectonic condition of the building, but design a unique figure. The extremity, of the, the extremity of the pillar beam describes both the anchoring view transversal section to the beam and the connecting section between the vertical supporting elements in the longitudinal, longitudinal direction. The, sup, uh, the support un undergoes a combined action of compression and flexion. Through a further anchoring of the support to the horizontal, horizontal plan of the gym, each pillar beam transfer, transfers the only vertical compression action to its foundation plinth. The beam is composed by three prefabricated elements of the same length. Sorry, the beam is composed by three prefabricated elements of the same length. The section. Of okay. The section of the elements follows a V-profile with a variable transversal section according to the direction of the internal cables. The beam making up the polygonal surface of the roof are tied up together through a set of connecting plates on the B-profile uh, profile crest on the each beam. So, why I uh, named the presentation Conceiving a, frig a Figure Through an Ideal Structure? Because uh, through research on uh, architectural shape of the roof, Vacchini describes the character of space and the expressive value of the architectural shape, a stone bike at the river, as he said. Structure, structure realizes the condition of the architectural type through only one element folded in space and placed on the ground. The roof virtually rests on the natural ground. 
The full grounded volume defining the gym floor, uh, floor is held inside by supports, then by the floor. In this sense, the absence of the base could describe the analogy um, Vakin that Vacchini proposed with the stone. The architectural shape of the roof defines the monolithic condition of the stone. The composition of ashlars is not structured through a disjunctive syntax of the elements. The joints between ashlars is filled up by building the superficial continuity of the elements. The full anchoring system between the ashlars defines a unity in the transfer of weight, making the building work as a whole structural figure. With Malimat, Vacchini builds a conditional uh, through which is, it acquires in its interior a new perception of a natural exterior space. But it is from the railway running either beside the building that Mulimat appears as an abstract stone carried by the river. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have two minutes for some comments. I think that this was complementary to the vision in the two previous presentations throughout this example. Mike. 